Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our new venue, uh, a venue that's invented by our lectures committee. So thank you, Gail. This is an interesting idea where it's much more open to students wandering around and hopefully kind of grabbing an idea or two uh, rather than in the isolated big hall. Uh, I'm Professor Mark Lowe. The reason I'm here is that both uh, Doug, Noble, and myself are the mentors to uh, Ken. And let me explain that. Ken, um, as you may know, kind of was one of the founders of our event called Historic Preservation Program, um, and was the director of it until 2011. In 2011, we kind of, the faculty decided that he needed to go tenure track. He's now tenure track, and that gives him a different level of responsibility, which means one thing, he gets mentored. <laughs> I'm not sure that's positive or negative. And, and, and also, uh, he has to give a lecture to us, to the faculty, at least, uh, invite him lecture so we can give him some assistance. So for the faculty who are here tonight, please make comments, if you'd like, in writing to either Doug or myself by email. Um, Ken has a PhD, as you all know, in art history from the University of Michigan, and he's also taught at the University of Texas, the University of Delaware, and that place called Sayar. Uh, he has uh, served as a member of the board of the Vernacular Architecture Forum, the Society of Architectural Historians, and he is currently the first vice president of the latter. Uh, he's an author of numerous articles on the history of the American Architecture and Design Library. Uh, he did a book on Henry Hobson Richardson, uh, basically which was published by the MIT Press on Small Public Library in 1997. It took me a while to realize that your interest in libraries went all the way back to 1997. Um, because three years ago I, I didn't realize that. Now, uh, fortunately, he's, I think he's back in the public library zone again, and he presently has just completed a book on, for the Library of Congress entitled The Library of America, Images from the Library of Congress. And to, to us locals, he's also, it's very interesting because he's currently working on a book on the institution and the architectural history of the Los Angeles public library system, which we're all very interested in. So please welcome Ken Brush. So, can, it is, is this working? It's hard to know. Okay. Um, actually, my interest in libraries goes back to probably when I was six or seven years old and was taken to the public library in my hometown. And then uh, at a slightly later date, as a Boy Scout, I helped to move the books from the city hall to a new public library, pushing shopping carts across town. So I have a long history with libraries, but um, most of the work uh, has evolved, it evolved actually during the undergraduate years and then graduate years at um, the University of Michigan. Um, the uh, title of the lecture, Building the Los Angeles Public Library, is intentionally uh, ambiguous in the sense that building can be uh, interpreted in a number of different ways. Uh, the work that... Uh, Is it, it, it doesn't seem to, it's not working anymore, I don't think. Is this, is it's just, it's the, it's not that it's not close, it's that it's not working. So. It's always nice being a guinea pig. <laughs> See how these new systems work. Um. To hear, so. All right. Okay, we're back, back online. Um, can you hear me at the Kodak Theater? I'm being simulcast um, to Hollywood. Uh, 
uh, in any case, um, it, I, although I trained as an architecture historian, really my um, interest has really been more in American studies and cultural history, using the buildings really as a, a kind of uh, means to understand broader issues of uh, culture. So that uh, the work I'm doing, which I'm going to talk about tonight, really is on the institutional uh, and architectural history of the uh, of the Los Angeles Public Library, um, with a focus this evening really on just the central building. Uh, although, I know I have this, this thing here. Uh, although, um, ambitiously, uh, I intend to. Uh, look at uh, the history of the system uh, and the library actually from 1872 when it was founded as a social library, a private library, um, pretty much up to the uh, to the present day, uh, which at the moment uh, includes 72 branch libraries, which you can see here uh, on this uh, tote bag that um, Judy Sandmeyer gave me for Christmas. Uh, it's just an indication that uh, administrators can occasionally be nice. Uh, and do something nice for you. Um, uh, in any case, uh, while the emphasis, and I'm just going to read a little statement to start here, uh, while the main emphasis of my work is on the physical facilities that make up the Los Angeles Public Library system, its buildings and the collections uh, and the collections and functions that they house also invite a much more expansive investigation into the symbolic and political nature of public architecture. A study of the library system as a whole likewise allows for a close examination of how this institution um, functions within the complex and constantly shifting urban and ethnic landscape of Los Angeles. Based upon more than three decades of research into the history and evolution of libraries in the United States, I'm attempting to place the story uh, of the uh, LA system within the broader history of the public library movement in America. This includes the invention and growth of the institution, uh, the roles that public funding as well as philanthropy have played uh, in this history, uh, and from an architectural perspective, uh, the theories related to the programming and physical planning that shaped the American library building in general uh, and the LA Public Library in uh, particular. Um, and uh, in that light, uh, I wanted to begin with just a little bit of uh, my own background in terms of my study of uh, libraries, as John mentioned. Um, uh, I wrote a book on uh, Henry Hobson Richardson and small libraries in America. Actually, uh, my uh, dissertation at the University of Michigan was on smaller public libraries in the 19th, uh, 19th century. Um, and uh, in, in a way, uh, my book, or my work, uh, extends back uh, to uh, the earliest of libraries, uh, shaped um, as they were uh, by the really formative module, I think you could say, uh, as I, I hope we can see as a uh, lecture, the talk continues, uh, the really formative module of the book, uh, or what the Romans called the Codex. This is um, the first, I think, uh, image of uh, Codex. It was actually a wooden book uh, that then evolved into the um, uh, paper book that uh, uh, began to be um, uh, invented in the Middle Ages. Uh, it was probably the spread of Christianity and the copying of uh, the Bible in particular that uh, really um, uh, uh, push that uh, that forward. Uh, the book of the Codex, of course, replaced the previous papyrus scrolls, um, which were uh, much more difficult to handle than the book. And in fact, uh, early on in the first century, uh, following um, the uh, birth of Christ, uh, Romans were already commenting on uh, the convenience of the book. Uh, I think in the same way that probably people are now commenting on uh, the convenience of the e-book uh, or the uh, the iPad. Uh, in any case. Uh, I'm going back to a kind of early history of the library because um, really very little has changed, uh, although uh, as I'll come back to at the end, the computer and uh, electronic media uh, certainly did we lose me again. The computer and the electronic media certainly uh, are going to have some impact uh, on 
uh, the uh, prevalence of the book and the uh, and the public library. But as you can see in this uh, illustration, this illuminated, from an illuminated uh, manuscript or Bible uh, from the seventh century, uh, very little really has changed uh, in terms of uh, the needs of the library. The fundamental requirements um, have, in fact, remained remarkably stable over time. Ample shelving for the storage of collections, quiet, comfortable, and well-lit places to read or to access a computer now, sites for the distribution of books and information to patrons, and spaces for a wide variety of administrative activities. The library's form, however, is still modulated by the geometry of the book and the spaces that architects have devised uh, to store and display it. And uh, we could go through, uh, certainly, the Middle Ages and uh, see how, as the book expanded, uh, libraries expanded. Likewise, this is uh, Arts End at the Bodleian Library, Oxford, from the uh, seventh uh, um, century, uh, or <clears throat> as we move into the classical and Baroque period, uh, they become more and more elaborate, and a kind of celebration, really, of the book and celebration of the information and knowledge that was housed in uh, in the library. Uh, these kinds of forms uh, here, as you see, with uh, uh, mezzanine balconies and alcoves, uh, actually uh, had a strong impact on the designs of Henry Hobson Richardson, who uh, I uh, later uh, studied in some depth here, the Woburn Public Library, where you can see uh, now in the 19th century, uh, the expansion of the collection really due to um, the lowering of cost of books uh, uh, as a result of uh, mechanized printing systems and uh, uh, wood pulp paper uh, as opposed to the earlier uh, paper. So this uh, certainly revolves uh, around my uh, earlier dissertation work, out of which came the uh, book on the libraries. Uh, I've also, uh, as John mentioned, uh, published uh, an article on LA Public Library uh, for an exhibition a number of years ago that was sponsored by the Getty and the Hammer Museum, uh, and have completed a manuscript for the Library of Congress on the American uh, American Public Library, uh, all of which uh, look closely uh, at the uh, style and meaning of libraries, but uh, in particular I've been interested in the planning of libraries and the accommodation of, uh, of the book. Uh, you can see in this section through the Woburn Public Library, uh, the book wing at the uh, right, which uh, is actually part of a very large rendering, which uh, exquisitely details each of the bindings of the books, not titles, but uh, sets them in place um, that um, helps to determine, of course, uh, that form of uh, that part of the library with uh, towards the center of the uh, delivery area and reading room. There's also a Natural History Museum left to the far left in that particular slide. Uh, as we move into the 20th century, beyond the small local libraries, um, the book uh, becomes more and more important in terms of uh, a kind of determinant of design, uh, no more, more so than in the New York Public Library um, by, uh, by Career and, uh, and Hastings, which we see here. This was a design that was actually uh, developed by John Shaw Billings, the director of the library, who then... Um, worked with the architects to develop the stack wing, which you see at the far uh, far left in this particular slide. Uh, here you can see it's um, uh, tinted um, uh, at the back of the building, uh, which uh, was a typical uh, location for stack wings uh, as we move into the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, librarians were lobbying for really warehouse-like spaces to store, uh, in the case of the New York Public Library, um, millions of uh, copies of, uh, of books or millions of volumes. Uh, Billings actually developed a very novel uh, kind of approach to the stack wing as opposed to just setting it behind the library um, as uh, you can see here. And I'm not using a point. I could use a pointer, I guess, but I don't know if there's anybody upstairs, but they won't be able to see the pointer. <laughs> so... Uh Probably not, but uh, the, the reading room is set actually on top of the stack wing uh, with elevators and mechanized systems so that uh, librarians working in the stacks can uh, deliver books uh, to the elevators, which are then brought up to the uh, to the delivery uh, delivery desk. Uh, and uh, in fact, this uh, system informed then, of course, the design of the Bryant Park facade of the library, which you can see here, which really does continue to evolve from that basic idea. Of the 
geometric module of uh, of the uh, of the book. Uh, I'm showing the, uh, the New York Public Library because this is one of the more advanced uh, planning uh, systems of the early 20th century. But it's also important in that uh, the librarian um, Ever Perry, who oversaw the construction of the LA Public Library, began his career uh, working for Billings at the New York Public Library and actually uh, was his assistant during the construction of this building. So he became very familiar with the uh, planning and ideas uh, ideas be, uh, behind it. Um, uh, the uh, LA Public Library, uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, has a, a history that precedes the, uh, the main building, certainly. Um, in 1872, a group of citizens uh, came together to form a subscription library, uh, which uh, actually was housed in the upper story of the Downey Block uh, in a couple of rooms. Uh, the idea that these early libraries in the 19th century were uh, typically housed in uh, the back rooms of drug stores or basements of churches or upper stories of commercial buildings is really a very common history that uh, places the LA Public Library within a much broader kind of context. Uh, it uh, became a public library about uh, six years later when the state passed legislation which allowed the city to actually tax citizens to support uh, the library, but it really remained in the Downey Block until 1889 uh, when it was uh, placed on the third floor of the new city hall, uh, which we see here, uh, a city hall that really was um, generated by the uh, tremendous, the, uh, cat you know, the uh, incredible growth of uh, Los Angeles uh, between uh, the 1870s and 1889 with the arrival of the railroads in the mid-1880s. Uh, the population jumped to um, more than 50,000 people in uh, just about a, a decade worth of time. Um, the uh, move to this, uh, these quarters, um, which you can uh, see here, uh, was uh, immediately uh, overwhelmed by the population and the collection of, uh, of books. And it was actually left um, between uh, 1889 and 1905 to three librarians uh, to kind of struggle with uh, the, uh, the issue of space. Uh, and eventually, by uh, the early part of the 20th century, actually, uh, with the weight of the books on the third floor of the city hall, which uh, were in danger of collapsing. Uh, but uh, between uh, Tessa Kelso, Kelso uh, Harriet Wadley, uh, and Mary Jones, uh, we see the library really being modernized. Uh, and by uh, 1905, it was being widely acclaimed as one of the most progressive libraries in the United States, in spite of the architectural uh, quarters that it was placed in. They had uh, lowered uh, the age for uh, readers to the age of 10. There were uh, outreach programs around the city. Uh, and uh, Tessa Kelso, Tessa Kelso in particular, uh, had uh, brought in a number of new innovations in the early 1890s. Uh, unfortunately, uh, 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 the progressive nature of these three women uh, probably um, led to the defeat of several uh, city bond issues uh, in the 1890s uh, that were uh, intended to fund the construction of a new uh, purpose-built public uh, public library. In fact, uh, all three of the women, uh, after a period of uh, between three and four years each, uh, were let go by the uh, library boards because of their uh, progressive tendency uh, Tessa Kelso, in particular, um, sued both uh, the city controller and a minister in the city just uh, about a month before the first of the bond issues, uh, and that uh, certainly contributed to its uh, its defeat. She sued the minister. Actually, I think I lost this again. Um, she sued the minister um, for slander, actually, because uh, he was uh, praying for her from the pulpit. Um, and she won, actually, uh, although she did leave the city and move on to, uh, to other things. Uh, it really ironically was left to uh, several uh, male directors to move the library forward out of the city hall. Um, 
quarters, uh, first to the Laughlin block where City Market is now uh, in 1905. Uh, that effort was actually spearheaded by um, Charles Lummis, uh, one of the great early characters in LA history, uh, who then uh, moved uh, the library a few years later uh, to the new uh, Hamburger department store uh, where it was uh, up on the third uh, floor of the, uh, of the building. Um, uh, as uh, we can see it, uh, see it here, um, he had hoped to uh, uh, arrange for a purpose-built built, uh, library building, but wasn't able to uh, accomplish that. Uh, the library remained here um, actually until the later teens, and this is the library that uh, Everett Perry arrived at uh, in uh, in 1911 after leaving the New York Public Library and replacing Charles Lummis, who also was let go. Um, uh, the Cantankerous library trustees, I guess. Uh, his wife, uh, Lila Perry, uh, joined him shortly after his arrival, um, and in her uh, journal, which is uh, at the Huntington Library, she writes that uh, Everett uh, sometimes uh, used sometimes to tell with a laugh that he was mistaken occasionally for a floor walker and asked where the Victrolas or the furniture department uh, was, uh, was located. Um, uh, just the same, uh, Everett Perry became a, a major um, sort of proponent of departmentalized libraries, uh, which I'll come back to in a moment. So his experience here, while uh, actually frustrating for him, uh, probably uh, further increased his interest in departmentalizing different areas of knowledge in a way similar to the departments in a, a department uh, store. Uh, it was under Perry that uh, the first branch libraries were constructed uh, using uh, Carnegie Corporation uh, money. There were five branches built between uh, around 1912 and 19, uh, 1916. This is just one, uh, the Coenga Carnegie Branch Library, 1916, uh, uh, which you can see here. Perry also moved the library from um, the Humburger department store uh, to the uh, 12th and 13th Store, uh, floors of the Metropolitan Building um, in uh, around 1917 or 1918. Uh, here we see it in 1924, just uh, before the move to the new uh, Bertram Goodhue Public Library would take place uh, that in 19, uh, 1926. Um, Perry was uh, faced with uh, a number of uh, major issues. The city uh, population continued to expand, uh, and the city continued to uh, follow the opening of the Los Angeles Aqueduct to uh, annex um, large tracts of land. Uh, the uh, city limits uh, went from uh, about 25 square miles to over 400 uh, square miles during uh, the late, uh, late teens. Almost everything you see uh, in the upper left hand uh, of uh, the slide here uh, in 1918 was annexed while Perry was the librarian. So that he was under a lot of pressure to both build a new uh, central library, but also to expand the branch system within uh, the city to accommodate uh, all of the new um, residents of uh, the new population of Los Angeles. Uh, so uh, he began a campaign working um, with various architects uh, sending proposals to, um, and this is uh, from a, a PDF file from ProQuest, so uh, the quality isn't as good as it will be uh, eventually, uh, but uh, projecting uh, ideas for uh, proposed designs for public libraries, which very much fell within the tradition of the grand classical public library, like the New York Public Library uh, or others uh, at, uh, at the time. This is a proposal that came out actually very shortly before uh, a new bond issue was floated before the voters of, of LA uh, with uh, a great deal of success due to uh, a lot of lobbying by uh, proponents of the public library and also probably illegally the library staff who were uh, city employees at the time. Uh, but they uh, produced uh, literature like this to um, it convince the public in 1921 to pass a $2.5 million bond issue for a new building but also new branch libraries. Uh, 
Uh, this was followed uh, in 1923 by another half million dollar bond issue to purchase land for the Central Library, which I'll be showing in a moment. And then uh, a third bond issue in 1925, really a remarkable series of victories for, uh, for the library for another um, two point, um, or another half a million dollars for um, expenses for the main building. Uh, under Perry's leadership uh, during this period of time, he died in 1933, 25 branch libraries were constructed, and of course, uh, the main library was built uh, as well. Uh, our current faculty club uh, began life as one of those branch libraries, um, the university branch. Uh, it then went through a, a number of different lives before uh, it became uh, the current, uh, we got its current use. But as you go in, uh, if you notice the freeze uh, to either side of the door, you can see the uh, original function uh, displayed. Um, uh, to either side of the uh, of the main uh, main entry um, of the building, uh, it was during this time uh, between 1921 and really 1924 or so uh, that uh, Goodhue was uh, struggling with uh, a design for the new public library, uh, being rejected many times actually by uh, the municipal art. Uh, commission and also the uh, Public Library Commission, uh, so much so that uh, in 1922, uh, he wrote to a friend of his, Mrs. Uh, Pearson in LA, um, uh, uh, writing that uh, the blank old library business is nowhere so far as I can make out. Uh, Winslow, um, uh, who was uh, Carlton Winslow, who is his associate architect, uh, writes me that the decision will be postponed <laughs> Uh, for some weeks yet. I've done all I could and played the game and they don't want me uh, uh, and they don't want me and that's all there is to it. But as I told you, I did expect the formality to be a formality and that I would be summoned out to LA again uh, with new designs for the building. Uh, he was during this time uh, working um, closely with Perry on uh, a uh, very uh, unusual uh, design for uh, the public library. Uh, he wanted at the center, um, on the second floor, uh, a service uh, area. You can see the registration desks and the return desks up at the top of the yellow area in this uh, particular uh, slide, uh, which would be flanked, as you can see, on four corners um, by uh, the stacks, uh, which were shifted from what we had seen at the uh, New York Public Library, and which was more typical of the time, from the rear of the building to actually uh, shafts in the uh, in the center of uh, of the building. Uh, this is a section, and those are in the corner, so it's not the exact location, but uh, in each corner the stacks. tower being proposed as uh, an overflow area for uh, books if the co co collection would uh, continue to, uh, to, uh, to expand. Uh, the idea behind this uh, was that uh, Perry um, wanted to incorporate 15 different uh, um, uh, departments, uh, library departments within, uh, within the building uh, arrayed around uh, stacks that were designed to house uh, about 1.2 million uh, volumes. Um, ironically uh, arranged somewhat like a department store uh, with uh, the books for each of the departments which um, uh, you can oops, sorry, see here uh, actually housed uh, in adjacent stack shelving, uh, which I'll come back to in a moment. Uh, Perry's idea for this uh, had actually first been proposed in the 19th century uh, by the eminent librarian William Frederick Poole as early as 1881. Uh, he was uh, lobbying for departmentalized library um, uh, quarters. Uh, the idea being that uh, you would have different subjects uh, in each one of these rooms with a specialized librarian who understood science or art or music uh, to cater to the patrons in the, uh, in the rooms. Uh, the idea actually was uh, incorporated at the Newberry Library in, uh, in Chicago, but really went very little.
uh, directly at hand, but uh, all of the rooms would be well lit because they'd all be on the exterior of the building, so that um, uh, it uh, lent itself to, uh, of course, the function of reading, uh, as well as the uh, idea of uh, utilitarian uh, convenience, which was very much on the minds of librarians at this uh, at this time. Uh, in fact, going all the way back to the 19th century, there's a, a real conflict between librarians and architects over the design of buildings. Nothing's changed much, probably. Uh, the librarians uh, or museum curators have one idea of how the institutions should be arranged. The architects often have another idea, and that's uh, part of a big part, actually, of my uh, discussion of Richardson's uh, work. Uh, the librarians actually hated Henry Hobson Richardson, and uh, in the Library Journal, when he died, actually, in 1886, basically said, thank God he's dead, because he's just uh, building all of these horrible buildings, uh, which the American Architect and Building News did not like, and they came back and uh, attacked the librarians, and this went on for a number of, uh, of years. Uh, they're also uh, dedicated, in any case, at the LA Public Library Arts uh, and, uh, and Music Rooms, as well as the um, more immediately uh, located uh, subject rooms. Uh, the uh, arrangement, uh, which undoubtedly came from Perry and not Goodhue, uh, however, uh, did, uh, of course, inform the form of the building, as we saw with the rear elevation of the New York Public Library. Uh, there are now uh, four stacked towers at the corners of the uh, central uh, tower of the building, um, which you can uh, see here within the lower uh, uh, subject-oriented rooms rotating around that. Um, uh, Goodhue, in terms of his uh, sort of disgruntledness, and actually he, comp he, he blamed it on all of the Iowans who had moved out to LA, uh, as I'll come back to in a moment, he was working simultaneously on the designs for the Iowa State Capitol, and so he sort of uh, um, combined uh, his ire uh, against uh, LA and uh, and Iowa. But what he originally proposed, which is what the uh, trustees wanted, was a uh, Spanish colonial revival building, um, as uh, as you can uh, you can see here. Uh, this uh, was uh, intended to be regionally appropriate, and even uh, this design, as uh, it was published in, you can see the Herald Examiner in 1923, uh, broke with uh, the traditional style of libraries. Uh, the Detroit Public Library being a renaissance uh, classicism, um, as was uh, the San Francisco Public Library, uh, which opened in 1917 and caused a great deal of envy in Los Angeles, uh, which still did not have its own uh, purpose-built uh, built public, uh, public library, uh, or uh, as we saw earlier, the uh, design by Dodd and Richards, uh, who thought they were actually going to get the commission for the public library because they had sort of cozied up to Perry. Um, and had produced uh, these designs which had helped to uh, pass uh, the bond issue in 1921. Um, uh Goodhue continued to uh, work uh, in the Spanish colonial uh, revival style, um, uh, being rejected uh, in terms of his designs a number of times by the City Arts Commission, uh, uh, but uh, all the while uh, uh, following really the, the uh, direction of the Library Board of Trustees, who were very familiar with Goodhue's work in the Spanish colonial revival style. Uh, he was the supervising architect for the Panama Pacific Exposition for example, and designed uh, the California building with this uh, elaborate trigger-esque kind of, of ornament. Uh, and from there he had gone on to get the commission for uh, the Throop Institute of Technology, uh, now Caltech. Um, uh, they changed their name shortly after Goodhue began to expand uh, or develop an expanded design for uh, for the campus. This uh, a rendering from uh, 1917, which certainly again was widely published, and the trustees of the LA Public Library would have known. Uh, it's only uh, at uh, the end of the design process uh, that uh, Goodhue begins to shift, and this is actually just before he himself dies in 1925. Uh, the building was completed by. By, um, Carlton Winslow and the Goodhue Associates. Uh, but here we see in uh, a rendering placing the library within its context from uh, just about 1925, produced by Goodhue Associates, uh, a shift away from the Spanish colonial revival to um, 
uh, what was uh, described as a, a more modern uh, kind of, of style. Arthur uh, Millier, uh, who talked uh, extensively with the architects, the Goodhue Associates, um, uh, Applaud, applauded actually the library trustees uh, for uh, uh, allowing this shift, this shift from a Spanish colonial to um, the uh, the current design for the library. Uh, by the time the actual work uh, commenced, he wrote, uh, the architect had outgrown um, the kind of uh, adaption of the Spanish colonial that he had uh, earlier been uh, promoting uh, in San Diego or in Pasadena, uh, and was commencing to think in terms of an American architecture for American building methods and conditions. Um, as uh, the sketches were worked over and over, the proposed building grew simpler and, uh, and simpler. Uh, and this was uh, in part uh, based upon uh, the work and the refinement of design that uh, was uh, being undertaken in Nebraska, uh, where he designed uh, and won the competition in 1922 for the Nebraska uh, Capitol building, uh, a tower and podium kind of arrangement uh, with uh, uh, assembly rooms and court rooms in the uh, lower um, uh, the lower uh, uh, two-story uh, wings of the building and then offices up above uh, with a, a dome in the tradition of uh, the traditional American capital buildings, but now with the kind of acknowledgement of the growing bureaucracy uh, that was state government at, uh, at the time. Uh, the result in LA was something similar with the central tower growing out of the podium um, basically uh, eschewing the earlier kind of Churigresque uh, decoration, which actually Goodhue himself uh, acknowledged in a letter to uh, his good uh, friends, the British architect William Lethaby. This is a letter um, at uh, Columbia um, in the library there where Goodhue's uh, correspondence is housed, uh, in which he wrote uh, in 1924, just as this transition was taking place, next month I shall be 55, and for almost 35 of those years I've been working in architecture, doing all sorts of kinds, all sorts and kinds of dreadful things, classic, gothic, and goodness knows what, and I still do. However, my gothic is no longer anything like historically correct, and my classic, my formalistic friends deny me the use of this term, is anything uh, but book classic. And now at Los Angeles, I have a public library in the same strange style, uh, or lack of style, I have been telling you uh, about. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, his rejection in a way of this more historicizing kind of uh, approach to design um, was, uh, represents a kind of interesting transition from uh, some of his earlier work. Uh, the Doheny Library, for example, here on campus, uh, is based on designs that Cram, Goodhue, and Ferguson um, made for uh, the Rice uh, Institute uh, in the early part of the 20th century, uh, located in Houston, where uh, they developed, uh, as you can see in the upper slide, um, a kind of combination of Spanish and Byzantine Mediterranean and forms which they thought were appropriate for the climate uh, of Houston. Little did they know what Houston's really like, but they thought of it as being very Mediterranean, uh, something more appropriate probably for Los Angeles, uh, which uh, Cram uh, resurrected actually for the Doheny Library in 1930. Um, there was actually a drawing for an administration building, which uh, he then added an upper story and stacks to to become the, uh, the Doheny Library. Uh, Interestingly, the Doheny, you know, has central stack system, not the four towers, but an unusual central stack system with uh, reading rooms rotating around it. So he clearly was familiar uh, with a good use building which stood across town, and undoubtedly uh, they had broken up, actually, I should point out, uh, sort of uh, not, not on friendly terms in 1913. Good Hugh went his way, Cram went his. Uh, but. Um, you can see that, uh, the, uh, that the Doheny really, while uh, adhering to Cram's uh, historicism, uh, actually um, uh, is uh, uh, his answer in a way to uh, 
uh, Goodhue's uh, building down, uh, downtown. And in fact, in his 1937 autobiography, uh, Cram wrote uh, that uh, uh, writing uh, about Rice first, that the location of uh, Rice in Texas uh, had drawn the firm to create something Southern in its spirit uh, and with some quality of continuity with the historic and cultural past. Manifestly, the only thing to do was to invent something approaching a new style, though not too new, and to develop a psychological excuse for it. Um, uh, he offered uh, this style, he then goes on to say, uh, as a sane and logical type of modernism, in quotes, better than much of what bears the name and has been evolved since the Rice Institute was begun. Uh, I think clearly uh, a jab at uh, Goodhue and uh, his much more stripped down design uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, Goodhue, uh, as many of you know, uh, not only worked with Perry, but uh, he had two other collaborators who had begun to work with him uh, at the Nebraska State Capitol. Um, uh, Lee Lowry, um, a celebrated sculptor who actually would go on to do a lot of work at Rockefeller Center, but who had been working with Goodhue earlier, uh, and a philosophy uh, teacher and anthropologist at the University of, of Nebraska, um, uh, Alex, um, uh, uh, Hartley Burr Alexander, uh, who had developed actually uh, an iconographic or sculptural program for the Nebraska State Capitol that focused on its location uh, in the middle of America with a great deal of emphasis on Midwestern history. There are images of buffaloes and Native Americans, uh, but also uh, a history of uh, the justice system that had led to uh, American democracy, which through manifest destiny had of course come to dominate the Great Plains as well as uh, California and, uh, and the West. Uh, Alexander, um, who actually was a very prominent philosopher in the early part of the 20th century, now forgotten. Uh, his papers are at Claremont College where he, retired, where he um, began to teach in the late 20s after uh, designing the program, the iconographic or symbolic program for the LA Public Library. Um, Alexander uh, wrote that uh, the theme of the LA Public Library uh, was one of uh, light and learning. Uh, studied in its entirety, the scheme of inscriptions and figures representative of the human exponents of enlightenment from the beginning of civilization to the modern type of thinker, philosopher, poet, writer, form a remarkably unified and eloquent depiction of the power of, uh, of the book. Uh, and of course, uh, you see that um, mosaic of the sun uh, in the uh, pyramidal uh, tower and then uh, a hand holding uh, a torch uh, which uh, represents the light of learning. Uh, I think this is uh, certainly the interpretation that uh, um, Alexander talks about and that has been given to the library, uh, but I think it's also important given his close friendship um, with um, uh, William Lethaby, uh, that uh, they will look uh, to him as well uh, for uh, what really is a, a kind of uh, arcane and mystic uh, program that develops at the LA Public Library. Uh, this is uh, Lethaby's book published, it's actually a reprint, but published originally in uh, 1891, uh, uh, that uh, certainly a good you would have known, and I find uh, sort of the frontispiece with the kind of stepped pyramid uh, to be very provocative. The book itself was an attempt to um, sort of look in almost uh, a pre jungian way uh, at common uh, motifs and themes uh, that work their way through architecture, domes, uh, uh, arches, and uh, other forms uh, like that that we'll be, be looking at uh, in, uh, in just, uh, just a moment. But uh, it's a, a kind of um, a pan uh, world look at uh, architectural themes that I think informs uh, certainly uh, Alexander's and Goodhue's approach to the LA Public Library here. Uh, of course, you see the culmination of the building with the uh, light of learning, the hand holding the uh, torch, which uh, now is uh, in a niche inside the library. What's up there is uh, a replacement uh, for the uh, the original uh, original torch. Um, um, and uh, then uh, here uh, we see um, 
uh, what uh, Alexander calls the uh, central theme of the library, uh, the book encircled by uh, a ray of, uh, of light um, with uh, an inscription from the Latin Vulgate uh, on the book which reads, a lamp to my feet, a light to, uh, to my path. And uh, we see uh, something similar in a way perhaps uh, in Lethaby uh, with uh, his uh, chapter on uh, the golden gate of the uh, of the sun in which he talks about this as uh, a kind of uh, primal uh, imagery that runs through uh, through architecture uh, from the east to the west and I, I think uh, this is important because uh, if we look at the kind of program that Alexander developed for the Midwest uh, that really focuses on a, a kind of American um, political uh, and judicial iconography when we get to LA uh, where uh, he's uh, designing a, a program for a building that's intended to house uh, all of the knowledge of history um, both Asian and uh, European which he acknowledges uh, in his sculptural program uh, we're looking at more of a pan-cultural kind of iconography one that I think is especially interesting because uh, he's now designing he and Goodyear are designing a building for the West Coast uh, and in uh, terms of Alexander's uh, anthropological work at the development of civilization, uh, it comes out, of course, of the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, drawing from Asia and then moving, uh, as was common at the time, common interpretation at the time, through Greece and Rome, Europe, to the United States, uh, where it, uh, of course, moves across the continent uh, and then reaches, uh, in a sense, the westernmost uh, limit of the continent, where it then uh, is reunited in a sense with the uh, with the east and I think that that's uh, an important underlying um, theme uh, in uh, in the overall iconography uh, and of the form of the building which attempts to uh, bring together references to um, still uh, Islamic Spain especially in the gardens and the fountains uh, or even the biblical gardens of, uh, of Babylon um, it also I, I think uh, this uh, if I go back um, motif which was sculpted by Lee Lowry um to surround uh, Alexander's inscription uh, is, I, I think, uh, provocative, and I don't have a final answer uh, in terms of this, but uh, just a couple of years earlier, Lowry had sculpted uh, the entry to uh, a new um, laboratory at Caltech, uh, which was called uh, the High Volts Building. It was intended to um, be the location of um, the uh, cutting edge uh, experiments in physics and electricity. Uh, at, uh, at the time. Uh, and of course, uh, electricity is the source of light uh, and knowledge, but I think uh, the sort of uh, similarity here uh, really is an attempt to then uh, take uh, a kind of historical iconography and push it forward in a kind of progressive, uh, progressive way. Uh, it's also provocative, and I'll just throw this out in that in 1918, um, Henry Adams published his uh, book, The Education of Henry. Adams, uh, in which uh, there's a chapter devoted to uh, the electric dynamo at the Paris Exposition of 1900, uh, in which he stands in front of it uh, and marvels at its power, and out of which he develops his own dynamic theory of history um, uh, in, uh, in some ways. And uh, the library in Los Angeles was supposed to represent sort of the literary history of, uh, of, the, uh, of the world at the time. Uh, the education of Henry Adams was widely read, and uh, Goodhue, um, I would expect, although there are reference to it, references to it, would have been aware of it in that uh, earlier uh, Henry Adams had uh, written Mont Saint-Michel and Chartres, um, a book that was uh, uh, absolute reading for any traveler in, uh, in Europe, uh, and one in which uh, he uh, really describes in great detail the sculptural program of Chartres Cathedral, which is really a medieval counterpart to the kind of encyclopedic sculptural program that Goodhue, Alexander, and Lowry attempt to uh, develop at uh, the LA Public Library. Um, that is, this is, I should point out, as I think you know, still a work in progress, so um, it's an area that I'm still, uh, still exploring. Uh, here uh, you can see the main entry where uh, some of that uh, sort of iconography and sculptural program um, is, uh, is developed. Um, 
what, uh, what we see here um, in the center uh, is uh, what um, uh, Alexander calls the symbolic torch race um, that recalls the cultural continuity uh, stretching back through Islamic Spain to the biblical gardens of Babylon. Uh, so uh, this uh, is an attempt to uh, look at the history of uh, uh, Western culture as deriving from the East and, as I say, ultimately finding its uh, way to uh, the western shore of the North American uh, continent. Um, the uh, riders, which clearly derive from the Parthenon frieze, of course, uh, are flanked by the uh, uh, images of Phosphor and Hesper. Um, uh, and it uh, is, uh, as Alexander says in his description, peculiarly in keeping with the great images of morning and evening stars, Phosphor and Hesper, um, that rise above this uh, this panel is, pe is peculiarly in keeping with that. Phosphor and Hesper, Phosphor and Hesper here are taken also as symbolizing the East and the West, with the light of wisdom carried forward in succession by the great thinkers of each world who have taken up the torch uh, in the age-long uh, um, course of history. Um, uh, and uh, as we move into the building then, uh, we see a kind of further uh, development really of this uh, universal kind of language of architecture as discussed by Lethaby. Uh, under the uh, pyramid is still uh, a dome uh, which derives from the original domed form of the, uh, of the building. Uh, this uh, Lethaby uh, describes uh, as the symbol of creation uh, in his book on architecture and mysticism. Um, in uh, the Goodhue building, uh, the dome again uh, uh depicts, uh, as you can see, this radiating uh, image of light, and uh, from uh, that there's um, a uh, large um, uh, chandelier, um, uh, actually weighing uh, more than a ton and nine feet in diameter, uh, which depicts the zodiac and is symbolic of uh, the form of the universe. Uh, uh, so. Um, uh, you can uh, you can see a continuation of that kind of sort of cosmic and symbolic imagery that uh, the library is uh, intended uh, intended I think to uh, to reflect uh, and uh, this uh, maybe more than anything uh, and uh, the um, um, uh, license in a way to uh, explore uh, further meanings of this uh, kind of imagery, I think, uh, uh, given uh, by this strange ensemble in the staircase of the uh, of the library, which uh, depicts the statue of civilization uh, between two um, sort of uh, Assyrian Egyptian sphinxes. Uh, the statue of uh, civilization uh, likewise recounts this sort of uh, march of uh, or evolution of history, as you can see. Uh, from Assyrian civilization, civilization uh, and it's not very clear at the top, up to uh, the American West and uh, the LA Public Library. And in fact, uh, in uh, her hands, she uh, bears uh, a, a star as a symbol of the state of, uh, of California. Uh, and then to uh, either side are these enigmatic sphinxes, uh, which call to mind um, the uh, words of um, Charles Whitaker, uh, a a colleague of good use uh, in which you can read uh, that he wrote, uh, the physical factors relating to the assembly of the materials uh, and their erection into a building are something that may be seen by whosoever cares. But the idea and the spirit behind any truly interesting piece of architecture are seldom penetrated save by uh, few. Uh, and he wrote this uh, just after Goodhue's death as part of his uh, memoriam. Uh, so uh, I hope uh, perhaps that I can be one of those few that can penetrate uh, further meaning in uh, this uh, this building in addition to uh, the uh, the other aspects that I've been talking about in terms of style and planning. Um, future uh, exploration uh, for this book uh, includes uh, further branch libraries that uh, were erected uh, very few during the Depression, but uh, as the city continued to expand um, uh, into the suburbs uh, after the war, uh, dozens of new modernist branch buildings were constructed, some of which survive, some of which uh, don't. This is the Canoga Park branch. Um, 
uh, and uh, 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 also uh, an exploration of uh, the near demise of the public library uh, by the 1970s. There was a great deal of uh, discussion, uh, debate about uh, whether or not the building should uh, be replaced with a new modern uh, structure, and there are actually some very interesting uh, designs for the replacement of the library. Uh, one, in fact, which uh, depicts uh, ramps uh, leaving the uh, um, uh, Hollywood or the uh, Pasadena Freeway uh, and driving directly into the library uh, where you could park and then get your uh, book. Uh, it was uh, this uh, attempt to um, uh, demolish the library uh, by uh, good modernist architects of the 1950s and 60s uh, well into the 70s that led to the creation of the LA Conservancy and so it brings me back to the issue of historic preservation which uh, of course uh, was um, further um, is further developed in terms of uh, the uh, rehabilitation of the building that took place after the two disastrous fires in 1988. Um, it uh, again was endangered uh, but was uh, again saved through uh, a lot of work by the LA Conservancy and others uh, and of course uh, in addition to the uh, restoration and rehabilitation there's also um, the addition by Hardy Holtzman Pfeiffer um, which I don't know if I'm up to writing about or not, but uh, we'll see when we get uh, get to that. Uh, finally, uh, in uh, 1989 and 1998, there were several uh, more bond issues were passed, which were passed by the citizens of LA, uh, and this led to uh, one of the most ambitious building programs uh, in the United States in terms of branch libraries. Here, just uh, again as an example, uh, Hutchinson Fung's uh, Hyde Park, uh, Miriam Matthews branch library. Uh, this brings up uh, issues of repurposing these branches to accommodate, uh, of course, the diversity of populations that by this date are um, uh, in Los Angeles um, in terms of, of uh, the design for, uh, for the buildings. Uh, and uh, finally, of course, uh, there is, uh, as I started out talking about, the, in, um, the issue of new media, of uh, computers uh, invading the library. Uh, which uh, has led many people to uh, talk about the demise of the uh, of the public library, uh, but in fact, uh, I think that's far from um, uh, happening. Um, the Pew Research Center, in fact, just uh, this year, um, came out with a report based upon uh, surveys that they took last year uh, called "Library Services in the Digital Age," uh, where 91% of the respondents said that uh, public libraries were important to their communities. Uh, and 60% of the respondents um, uh, acknowledged having some contact or interaction with their own, own local library within the last uh, 12 months. Um, and 73% uh, of the people who visit public libraries uh, said that they went there to uh, browse the shelves or buy out print books, whereas uh, fewer than 30% went to use uh, the computer facilities. Uh, all of this, of course, is going to be impacted by the digital book, the e-book, etc. But libraries continue to be very vital community centers, uh, centers for teenagers to gather, cultural centers for lectures, uh, etc. And uh, in fact, even with the invasion of the computer, uh, many of the uh, needs are very similar. Uh, people go there to both interact with the public, but also maintain a kind of sense of privacy, uh, and also to absorb the kinds of knowledge that's available uh, through books or through uh, electronic media. Yeah. So, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ken. Um, I certainly know a little more about libraries than I did a few minutes ago. Well, uh, I wanted to know. I, I was going to say that, but I'm glad you said I didn't because I would be in trouble. <laughs> but we do have uh, time for a few questions and answers before we have refreshments. Um, there's some refreshments on this floor just around the corner. But would anybody like to ask Ken a few questions about libraries? Yes, Amy. I, I can add to that 
sort of briefly. I mean, there are librarians who are working on the history of libraries, but not from an architectural perspective by any means. In fact, they pretty much ignore the architecture. And I really feel that you know libraries are formed by the architecture. It's it's, it's an integrated kind of process. It's where people sit and read. It's where you store books. Uh, and so it's necessary to understand the buildings. There has been work on Carnegie libraries. Uh, and there are a number of books that have been published, uh, one by a colleague of mine, uh, Abby Van Slyke, which is, is really a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful book on the Carnegie uh, design process and the meaning and impact of Carnegie libraries. Uh, there's been very little other than uh, occasional monographs or articles on individual buildings. Uh, there's nothing uh, out there in the way of a study of the full library system or even uh, the kind of in-depth study that I'm trying to uh, approach the LA Public Library with. I'm going back, you know, um, 50 years before the main building was constructed because I think it really informs where it comes from. It also reflects uh, very much the culture and politics of Los Angeles. It took them 50 years to get a building and they wanted one almost from day one, uh, which <laughs> says a lot about Los Angeles then and now, I think. Um, uh, I probably know more about library architecture than certainly anybody else in the United States. Um, I've been uh, at it for a whole lot longer. So I really think that this, I mean, I'm hoping it's a groundbreaking book in terms of uh, a very detailed and broad study um, uh, and contextual study of a library and a library system and, and how it impacts the city. I'm also really uh, hoping as you know, a great proponent of libraries have been on, uh, in fact, to kind of gain further knowledge about how all of this comes about, but also because of my love of libraries. I've been on the Santa Monica Public Library board for the last nine years. Um, but I'm hoping that, you know, the LA Library has had some ups and downs, uh, and it really is in need of a great uh, monograph on it, with all of the blemishes as well as the positive uh, aspects of it. But people need to understand where it came from and what it means and what it's meant to the city. Um, as I think the Pew survey shows, people really still uh, are dependent on public libraries. They're really important to them. This, this is very interesting. Uh, uh, given what you said in the very beginning, that is this antagonism uh, between architects and librarians, yeah. it made me wonder, what do librarians think about well, libraries? Where are they at this point? terms of thinking about what the new public library Well, I, I think that they've reconciled, certainly, you know, in, in the last decades since World War II. Um, the problem in the 19th century was that uh, the public and the architects wanted these grand, elaborate spaces. You know, coming out of that Baroque era, uh, the librarians, by uh, they were professionalizing um, beginning in the 1870s. They just wanted warehouses for books, at least the leading proponents. Uh, they, they wanted no wasted space. They didn't want grand staircases. They didn't want the kind of alcoves that Richardson was designing, which were actually very difficult for them because the stacks were closed at the time. So if somebody ordered a book, the librarian had to run down to the end of the building, go up a little spiral staircase, go in and out of the alcoves, grab it, and come back down. You could see why they were not happy. Um, now I think, uh, I think though, um, a lot of the issues have been, been worked out. For example, um, I think the librarians at the Santa Monica Public Library, which I can speak to firsthand, really love their building um, by Mo Robo Udell, who actually, you know, well, they're pretty good designers, but, uh, but they, they really understand programming uh, and institutional program, programming, I think, very well. They listened to the librarians and gave them what, uh, what they wanted. But it's an issue in flux, you know, keeping up with um, the new technologies is, is difficult. In fact, uh, when the Santa Monica Public Library was designed, it was designed with a six inch plenum so that they could uh, uh, take all of the wiring to each of the tables uh, for uh, computer use. Uh, and even before it opened, Wi-Fi was introduced. So it was never used in that way. Although it was used for sustainable purposes, there's uh, also um, heating and air conditioning in there. But it was sort of a, an odd circumstance. They were so proud. Uh, we were so proud, we had this uh, state of the art, you know, like the Salk Institute, the, uh, the server area for the library, and it wasn't needed. So, um, you know, I, I think architects are understanding that a whole lot more than earlier on. Yeah, I just, you know, often people who love books, yeah. I've got a book lover's room in there, which is kind of interesting. 
people who love books, uh, love books, mm -hmm. uh, in a way may not be as sensitive to what you talked about, that is the sort of public service role of libraries today compared to you know, what they were like 10 years yeah. ago or 20 years ago. So I'm just kind of curious whether or not librarians are still, um, in a way, caught in a, in a way of thinking about what the library was and what it could be and should be, well, might be, as opposed to where it's likely to go, given uh, advanced... I, I think they're really aware of where, you know, what's happening. Yeah. Um, and I think they're, they're very interested in public programming. And, I mean, they uh, have all night gaming events for high school students at the Santa Monica, well, at a lot of public libraries, you know, to, because they know the students want to come in and use the computers and play against each other. Uh, and they're very open to that. The librarians are also, you know, great proponents of the First Amendment and, uh, you know, free speech. Uh, and they see the libraries as really being a podium, I think, for free speech in America, um, really opposing a lot of the legislation that Homeland Security passed about being able to um, see people's library records, for example. Uh, the librarians were furious over that, but of course, legally, they were bound to uh, follow the law. But um, So I, I think they're, they're, it's a very progressive group. I mean, I have spent, <laughs> you know, I, I've probably visited, I, I've lost track, three or four hundred libraries now in the United States over uh, the last decades. and. Um, I find librarians to really be remarkable and across the board just there to serve people in, in the ways that they want. So it's the reason you find homeless uh, in the libraries, which people complain about all the time, but uh, they're not going to be turned away unless they're a real nuisance. Ken, in reference to the um, LA Public Library, I think you mentioned at one point that architects are quite interested in having the building replaced because they have an or a commission? Were you one of them? Uh, I, <laughs> no, I, ha I haven't actually heard of that. Like, oh, yeah. I have heard that the LA City Public Librarian wanted to demolish the building in memory of himself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about in memory of himself. Uh, it's, it's a complicated story, which of course I didn't have time to talk about here. Uh, you know, one of the things that I'm really interested in, too, and as kind of art, kind of architectural historian, is not just the original design, which I talked about, but the life of the building and how it changes and adapts over time, which doesn't get talked about very often in architectural histories. Jeff Chusick did a good job, I think, in his monograph on the Freeman House, and I think that's a kind of model for that. Um, the librarians actually wanted to see the building demolished, so I have to admit. Um, and the reason, uh, primary reason, was it was just completely overcrowded. There was no new money for expanding the library. And they argued that that kind of stack system uh, that, that you built would act like chimneys, like flues, which in fact it did, um, and was one of the causes of that fire. Now that could have been remedied, but uh, because there was so much deferred maintenance, et cetera, it was really a kind of fire trap and wasn't working the way uh, they wanted it. Ultimately, this idea of a subject-oriented library um, is not easy to adapt to. Um, it's you know you have a room, you have all of these separate rooms. Whereas you know in post-war modernist design theory, you want open, flexible space, and that's what you see in uh, most new libraries now, uh, with some specialized rooms for reference or history collections or rare books, but for the most part, open stacks, uh, open. Uh, seating uh, that can be reconfigured in different ways when, uh, when the future evolves. In fact, um, at the Santa Monica Public Library, and I know this is true elsewhere as well, uh, they just moved some of the book stacks around the bookshelf and around to make room for new, more computers. So, um, you know, they're adapting to that kind of uh, uh, public need, and I think that will continue to, to happen. So. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, so the original design was not very functional in the long run for the LA Public Library. But the idea, as I said, behind it was that you would have a specialized library and you would have a music library and, or an art library that you could go to, as opposed to a generalist, uh, and would say, oh, this is the book you want on Caravaggio, you know, it's right here. Um, and there's something to be said for that. And there are still specialists, of course, in libraries now. They're sort of put together with the um, Earphones and microphones. Okay. 
hockey each other and move each other around, which is what the federal can do now. You don't have a specialist there that can come to New York and talk to the person you're talking to. So that's another new technology that's uh, appearing in libraries. Well, at that point, thank you very much.